All right, guys, welcome to a new video. As you can see, my V12 block for my 8 series, my E31 850i, is still here on the stand in front of me. Things haven't really changed much since the last video. Main reason being is I can't assemble this engine. I can't put it together. And as it stands, it's a lump of junk. And the reason for that is, I believe that the machining that was done on this block is substandard and as a result my piston protrusion is way out of spec so much so that the engine can't be assembled in the condition that it's in so i'm after receiving my brand new cylinder heads or my recently refurbished cylinder heads i've got my head gaskets and the next step is to plant the head gaskets on stick my heads on and start assembling the engine because the whole bottom end is done uh, as i covered in the last video but the issue that i've run into is the amount of protrusion and piston protrusion is obviously the amount of protrusion that is present when your pistons are top dead center now this engine is designed that you have a level of protrusion so some engines the pistons do not protrude at all but on the m70 they do now this bank was decked so it was skimmed just like this one here was the problem is and I'll show you my measurements in a moment. I've measured my piston protrusion across bank two. So these are cylinders seven through 12, and they're all perfectly uniform. You can see the level of chamfer is the same on every single cylinder top. The level of protrusion is in around 0.8 of a mil, or sorry, um, yes, in around 0.8 of a mil, uh, 0.8, 0.85, 0.85, 0.85, 0.8. The nice and uniform. Yet when we come to this side, Piston protrusion is way off. Um, by the way, the acceptable level of, of piston protrusion for the smaller head gasket, um, I think, is around 0.63 of a mil. Okay, so all those figures I just mentioned, they're obviously in the 0.8s, which is pretty high. But that basically means you're just moving into the thicker head gasket. So you can use up to, I think it's around 0.83 mil. So they're in around 0.85. So that's fine to use the thicker head gasket. But if you're anywhere from 0.63 to about 0.83 you need to use the thicker head gasket so I'm in thicker head gasket territory I always knew that but the issue I have is piston protrusion on cylinders 1 and 2 is fine it's within, within spec so what do we have uh, 0.8 and 0.88 so 0.88 is maybe a little bit high but then we start increasing and increasing and increasing all the way up to 1.45 millimeters now it's absolutely baffling um, how it's so wrong so let me just read out the protrusions so protrusion on one as it says 0 0.88 0 0.8 0 0.85 i'm reading the wrong ones jesus christ 0 0.8 0 0.88 1.05 1.15 1.3 and 1.45 so the deck is falling away as it graduates towards the rear of the block. I'm absolutely raging. Um, I have done nothing wrong. The bottom end assembly has been absolutely perfect. Um, the fact that the conrods, all well, the pistons obviously share the same journals from one side to the other side. So the crank goes through the middle. They're sharing the same journal. So you can't have one side off and the other side not. The only thing that's wrong is the machining. Um, now I've been on to the machine shop about it, I've kept it all in email to keep it formal and I was nice, I was, uh, what can we do to fix this? The guys that want to know about it, um, they basically said the level of machining that I'm saying it's out by would be physically impossible for them to do, it's absolutely possible to do if you didn't have it properly leveled in the jig. Um, I was in full agreement that they did this bank properly, but they were maintaining they took off a maximum point I think it was 0 0.08 to 0 0.12 of a mil but we're right here from front to back by 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 of a mil it's it's way off um and in my last email i just laid it all out i sent the pictures i sent them proof i've measured the deck as well you can see it graduate off towards the rear the chamfers disappear as it graduates backwards so you can still see the original chamfers just about um, actually they're, they're fairly intact here on the first two then they just start disappearing towards the back. I mean, all the proof is there that the, that the deck was machined incorrectly and they've just stopped applying. They don't care anymore. 
um, because I laid out all the costs of getting all these piston crowns machined, um, new rod bolts, getting the pistons recoated, all the amount of time involved in reassembling it, uh, and that's when they stopped replying. So, two machine shops now uh, with substandard work, and it just leaves me uh, uh, between a rock and a hard place. Now full disclosure, I wasn't using a dowel gauge to determine piston protrusion. Uh, I'm just using these feeler gauges as you can see, but they're 99, 98% accurate. They give you a very good idea of the level of protrusion. And just to show you here, remember my markings here or my uh, notes, 1.3 is cylinder number five. This is 1.25 on the feeler gauge. They're just the two stacked together. And this is, as I say, piston 11, and as you can see, that's the level of protrusion that I have, there's, there's no question about it. Um, it's very clear that they're all way off, and as I say, on three, four, five, and all the way up to six, and I can't actually show you six because I've actually removed that piston because I've already started uh, the process to get this stuff rectified, so I already have 12 taken apart. I actually have number six there as well, so obviously, uh, number 6 and 12, they're opposite each other, and I actually took this piston and popped into this cylinder to see if it would make any difference. I know the level of protrusion is exactly the same, there's no difference in the length of the con rods. Obviously the bearings have no bearing on the actual measurement either, I mean, we're talking 0 .01, 0 0 0.001 of a millimetre in terms of the difference with the, the bearings, so that's got zero impact on the actual level of piston protrusion also. So again, there's, there's no question that this deck is off and you could make the argument, oh maybe the decks were done at some stage, maybe they had a head gasket blow or something in the past. No, but the level of protrusion that exists between these four cylinders, um, combustion ratio would have been way, way off. Um, and this also had the original head gasket, wherever I have it. And I've measured the head gasket and this is the standard 1.6 something uh, mil gasket. So there's no way you could have that level of protrusion with that gasket. So again, the head's never been worked on. It was the first time. So yeah, I'm just gonna have to get these pistons rectified and that's why I've started taking them apart. So let's cover what I'm about to do. Oh, and a quick aside, you're probably wondering, well, why can't you just slap on a thicker head gasket? Well, I am slapping on a thicker head gasket. The maximum size one that's available is 2.1 mil. There's gonna be a level of compression with that as well. So even with that thicker head gasket, you really run the risk of even this cylinder number six striking the underside of the cylinder head because the cylinder heads had 0.15 to 0.2 of a mil taken off it. And you also run the risk of the actual valve striking the top of the crown also. And the second reason is the level of incons inconsistency. So even if that wasn't the case, even if you didn't run the risk of the pistons actually hitting the cylinder head, you've got a massive level of uh, lack of consistency between all these cylinders. So the compulsion ratio is gonna be way off between all the different cylinders and the engine is gonna run like dog shit. So it's super important that this is done properly. And that's why we're going down the route that we are. And that is shaving the pistons. Now, let it be said, I don't like the idea of shaving a piston any more than you do. The other option I have is obviously sourcing an entirely new block. And I don't want to go down that road because you want your pistons to be matched to your block and buying someone else's block and buying unknown condition, unknown history. And I might as well be starting from scratch and that's going to cost thousands of euro and then it's still an unknown as to the condition of that block. So at least I have something that I know about here in terms of its history. I'm happy with the condition of the block, I'm happy with all the pistons, I'm happy with all the conrods, all the components that make up the drivetrain. The only thing that's a problem at the moment is piston protrusion. So these are aluminium pistons as I mentioned in the previous video. They have a iron coating which we'll also have to sort after that these are trimmed or machined. And the machining that I'm talking about is basically taking off whatever the respective amount is of pistons number three through six. So we'll have to take these measurements into account and take off only as much as is needed to bring the level of protrusion down to an acceptable level. So the acceptable level I'm gonna aim for is anywhere from, well not anywhere, I'm gonna pick a precise number, but I'm thinking in around 0.85, which is basically in line with the other pistons, the level of protrusion. So 
So obviously with piston number 6, 1.45, I'm going to have to take off a considerable amount, which is 0.6 of a mil. In the grand scheme of things, it's not a huge amount. And in terms of weight, we also have to account for the weight also. We also have to account for these actual valve pockets, which are really quite slight um, on these pistons, but they need to be counted for nonetheless. So essentially what we're doing is we're going to be sitting, I won't be doing it myself, I'm going to pass it to a local machine shop. And they're essentially going to... I, I'm going to instruct them with different measurements for each of the four pistons. By the way, we are obviously only doing four pistons, we're not doing all 12. And they're going to start by uh, recessing these actual valve grooves or the valve pockets by, say for example, number 12 here. They're going to have to drop them by about 0.6. Then they're going to have to do the actual outer of the crown, drop that by 0.6. And then we're going to have to uh, mimic the dish and drop that by the respective amount such that it produces the same inner capacity or the cc capacity of the dish so this three basically separate process that needs to be done on each of the pistons and the first thing i need to do is determine what the capacity of this is and we do that by filling it with liquid and measuring the amount of liquid and basically we want the before which is now and the after after the machining both capacities to be the same so that way our combustion chamber capacity maintains the same as the rest of the chambers across the block then the last process we'll have to do is, where are my pins? Uh, these are the piston pins here. And what I'm going to do is to balance all of the pistons in the block. So I'm going to have to remove all 12 pistons, take all of them apart. And we're going to probably just reduce the weight of these. So I've actually weighed these and these are bloody heavy. So these are around 350 grams, give or take. And these are actually 110 grams. So you wouldn't think it, but these weigh a lot because these are obviously hardened steel. And one of the best ways to remove uh, uh, weight from a piston is to, you can actually take some from the inside of this pin. You're only taking a very small amount and just dropping this by in and around five grams or so. Again, I'll have to do these specific measurements. Should bring, uh, on all the other pistons, should bring them all back in line. Potentially even better balanced than they were from the factory because I actually measured the weight of 12 and six as a complete item. And there's actually 1.5 grams in the difference, which uh, is a difference. It's not really that important on the, just a regular road car. Um, but it is a difference nonetheless. And I want to get them in line with that, if not slightly better. So, yes, let's get going. So here's my ghetto setup, but this is very commonly done. Now you typically do use paraffin or alcohol and not water, but water is all I have to hand. So I've basically just put Vaseline jelly along the top of the crown of the piston, planted this old piece of plexiglass on top, and I've got a hole in the top there. So I'm gonna measure out 10 mil of fluid. Uh, this is the largest syringe I could get my hands on. So let's just make this 10. I have my 10 mils, so I'm going to start injecting 10 mils of fluid. And that's the very last of it. So that was... There's 0.1 of a mil left. So I put in 19.9 mils. What happens if I try and squeeze in the last mil? Okay, so we're going to go with 19.9. I might do it just once more to confirm that result. That's piston number 12. Of course, this is one of the most painstaking things is undoing your own work. And if you remember, a full set of these rod bolts is... 180 euro so yeah that's lovely piston number five And that's the last one. So while I'm waiting for my pistons to come back, I thought it would be a good time to take apart the oil pump. Now, thankfully, it is in very good condition. The outside of it, I've actually done a clean up on it, even though it doesn't look the cleanest, but 
that is all scrubbed down and degreased and it's about as clean as I can get it. Inside looks very, very good, no issues there at all. And obviously the main things that we want to check out are the actual oil pump and uh, the drive components themselves. And thankfully they are also in very good condition. Uh, there is some slight wear, uh, surface wear on the actual um, cogs themselves. As you can see just on the outer uh, edges of those teeth, you can see some slight surface wear, but no real issues. And there is just one mark on it that's mildly concerning. There it is there, but it doesn't really bother me that much. Your fingernail ever slightly catches on that. But that's the only bit of damage on the entire thing. And there's nothing there that's going to cause this pump to fail. I've done a similar check uh, on these components. And again, these are even better. There's nothing at all wrong with these. There's ever so slight pitting on it. Uh, but I think that's to be expected with pump components, especially a 30 year old pump. But they're such solid components. It's quite a simple design as well. Uh, it's quite interesting as you rotate this uh, clockwise, it spins anti-clockwise. As you can see like that, and then I spin it anti-clockwise, it actually spins clockwise within the components. So uh, the actual gauze on the bottom here has some very large pieces of black, either carbon or plastic, or like old gaskets stuck in them. I have to shake the whole thing out just to get them out. So anyway, that's all cleaned out. And the most interesting thing of all, and I think uh, uh, M539 Restoration saw the same thing with his pump, this piston that basically goes up and down inside here was completely seized up. You can actually see it on the inside, just about. Uh, this was completely seized inside and there's nothing in it. You'd expect it when you unseize it, you can actually see what's causing it to fail uh, or to get stuck, but there was nothing wrong with it at all. So basically all I did was, and it could be just down to actually the surface pitting on the inside of the actual pump itself, but I ran some scotch bright up and down the inside of the actual uh, piston chamber or the cylinder uh, multiple times. It took me about half an hour to uh, really get it nice and smooth again. And I took any kind of excess plastic off um, that was causing issues. It's a little bit rough uh, around those windows. But anyway, it's now super smooth. It goes all the way to the end of its travel and comes all the way back out uh, nice and smooth. And that's what no oil, when it's oiled up, it's even better again. I have two new O-rings here as well. So they just get reinstalled. Uh, in these two locations here and here and yeah so I've done a refurb on all the bolts as well and once this is back together it should run like new okay so as you can see I have all 12 pistons now fully removed from the block and each one is fully disassembled each one of these boxes contains the respective con rod bearings, wrist pin, ring set, circ clips, etc, etc. So they're all ready to roll. And as you can see, there's 12 pistons here, which means I got four back from Micron Engineering. So they've basically completed the machine work that I requested. And all four of these crowns have been reduced in height by the respective amount that I asked for. And they've also enlarged the dish and they've also performed the machine, the required machine work on the actual valve pockets themselves. So the work done is absolutely fantastic. Very, very happy because I basically reinstalled all these pistons and I remeasured the protrusion and they are now back in line with all the other pistons. So as you can see, everything is in and around 0.83 to 0.85. So these were the four here and they are absolutely spot on the measurements I gave and then the actual uh, work performed are perfectly in line with what I asked for and what I received. So absolutely delighted with that. I've re-measured the CC capacity of each of these dishes as well. And they are now, so the original factory was in and around 19.6, 19.4. Um, it's hard to get an exact reading. And they're all hovering in around the 19 mark, which I'm more than happy with. I think the entire combustion chamber uh, capacity is in around 52 cc if I recall that's including the head obviously and then combined with the dish of each of the pistons so they're pretty much bang on in terms of spec and I've also as you can see engraved each one of these pistons with the respective number so I know which cylinder it came from and also the direction of install reason being is I'm about to send these off for coating. So I'm going to get a thermal top coat applied to all 12. I'm not just going to do four. I don't think I can do four because I don't want to create some kind of a thermal imbalance between all the pistons. So that's why I'm doing all 12. 
and while I'm doing it I'm also going to get a super slick uh, sear coat uh, uh, coating applied to the actual skirts themselves also so it's going to be a two-stage process and I'm going to send it down to performance coatings in Cork so these are all being shipped uh, tomorrow with DPD and the guy should have them tomorrow so I basically just made sure they're fully uh, disassembled everything's cleaned they're gonna get bead blasted um, and they get uh, fully degreased as well um, and then they get painted not in that order I would imagine they <laughs> bead blast them first then degrease them uh, and then paint them so that's why I basically numbered from the top and also put the direction of installation just in case I lose these markings they're also going to be on the underside so that's the reason for that what a job but it has to be done uh, yeah let's see how these look when they come back all right so it's a few days later and at the risk of boring you guys to death with even more figures just take a look at what I've written down here these are all the weights of the pistons. So in this column here, we have the weight of every piston. So that's the actual piston top itself. Here we have the weight of every single gudgeon pin or wrist pin. So I weighed every single one individually. And in this column, we have every one of them combined. So 353 plus 106 equals 460 grams. So I know I said I wasn't going to alter the weight of these pistons in any way. But what I noticed was once I got the four pistons back that were altered, so that's piston three, four, five, and six, they were all kind of hovering in and around three, four, nine, three, four, nine, three, four, eight, three, four, nine. And that resulted in a kind of weight discrepancy as such. So the lightest one of these was in and around four, five, five. And here we have one of the unaltered pistons. This was the heaviest one, piston number 12. So Piston plus pin combined was actually 462. So from the lightest to the heaviest, there's actually a seven gram difference between the piston and the wrist pin combined. Now, to be honest, six or seven grams over the weight of both the piston and the pin combined is probably acceptable, but it just, I wasn't happy with it. You know, you, you're, you want your piston to be in and around maybe three, four grams top difference. And that's kind of the, the, the range that I wanted to get to. So basically what I've done is I've been altering the innards of every single one of these pins. So I've reduced the weight of each one. Basically with my Dremel tool, it takes a bloody long time, 45 to 50 minutes to do each pin, just to reduce it. Now, in terms of weight, by about four grams. Um, overall kind of uh, weight percentage, we've only dropped the weight uh, of the pin in around three four percent and what we've ended up with is if we just take a look here uh, so like I mentioned pistons three through to six and um, these are the lightest pistons so the very lightest one so the piston and pin combined was 455 grams and what I've basically done is I brought all the other pistons down to four five seven Reason being is I didn't really want to take any more material off. This was the heaviest one, so this required the most amount of weight to be removed from the pin. So it was 462 combined, this plus this, and now it's dropped to 457. So that's where I started. And I basically used that as the kind of default weight and every single piston combined. So I've removed weight from all of these pins, resulted in 457 exactly so we're talking not even a discrepancy of 0 0.01 or sorry 0 0.1 of a percent everything is bang on so as you can see all the way up to um number seven here then we're into the modified ones so we're only two grams off two grams off um, and then even less in you know, went one gram off and you know one gram one and a half grams off and then i still have to do this very top one but as you can see four five seven for two and number one's also going to be four five seven so these are actually better balanced than they were from the factory because funnily enough, if you look at the original weights, so again, just discount, um, I don't actually have original measurements for these four that were altered, but even here from the ones I have measured, 460.4, so 460 and a half, all the way up to 462, um, nearly 463. So that's about two and a half grams off. So we've no more than a two gram discrepancy now. And not only that, as you can see, they kind of fluctuate a little bit, half a gram here, one gram there. These are all bang on. So I'm more than happy with that. It's taken me 
10 hours now to get this all finished. I've used unbelievable amount of them. That's only about a third of what I've used. The rest are in the bin. Um, but yeah, it takes quite a time to get it done. But you know what? I'm just going to be happier for it that all these pistons in terms of weight are perfectly balanced. So once the pistons come back uh, from the CR coating, everything is just ready to be assembled and put back together. And just to show you the actual pin, I've basically done the same as I mentioned to every single one of them. I just started off with a chamfer on the outside kind of, you know, top 10 mil or so. I did that with the, I don't know where it is, the larger sanding uh, drum. And then I moved towards the smaller one for the inside. So it kind of tapers towards the inside, right up to around the 50% point. Um, so it's a little bit wider on the section compared to what it is on the inside. Just takes a very, very long time. I could have given these to the machine shop. And they could have stuck them on a lathe. But I would have been into even more money and this is costing me an absolute fortune to rectify this uh, horrible mistake. So um, I just need to start saving money and I decided to sit down, you know what, and just do it myself. It'd be great to have it done. Uh, it nearly is done. 45 minutes, I'll have the last one finished. And once the pistons come back, we can reassemble them. So looking forward to that. It's an exciting day. It took about two and a half weeks or so, but the pistons have just arrived back from protective and performance coatings in cork and even look at the way they've packed them they've individually packed every single piston so they don't get damaged on the way back absolutely excellent but wait until you get a look i've already had a look at this at the finish on these pistons it is absolutely exquisite unbelievable so let me explain what these coatings are. Now the coating that I've gone for on all of the pistons is a dual sear coat finish. So sear coat have been in the thermal kind of protective coating game for a very long time, especially with firearms parts, and they've had uh, piston products for quite a while too. So I've gone with the thermal top coat, which is C186, and then the side coat is their super slick C110. And the first thought you probably have is, how thick is this finish? Surely this is going to impinge on the um, dimensions of the cylinder wall and start rubbing on the cylinder wall. So the top coat is 0 0.025 of a millimeter in terms of thickness. And the side super slick coating is one quarter of that. Okay, so it's unbelievably thin. It's essentially uh, 25 microns on the top and it's 25% uh, of that on the side so it's unbelievably thin so we don't have to worry about the dimensionality of the actual piston um, if you consider the original iron coat and by the way the original actual process for this is I ship them off the first thing the guys do is they uh, chemically and ultrasonically clean the pistons fully uh, then they gas them out in an oven then they bead blast them then they clean them again and then they actually apply the coating uh, on the top so they are unbelievably well finished, as you can see the undersides there as well. Uh, they actually plug the boss holes here, so uh, it doesn't. We don't get a coating on um, the inside of the holes themselves. And as you can see, it's actually quite a thin film on the inside of uh, the ring lands here. And uh, if you compare the finish here to the finish on the inside of the grooves, it's a lot lighter. So again, that doesn't impinge on the actual rotation or the movement of the rings themselves. Um, so delighted with the finish on them. Uh, it looks unbelievably well. Not that that matters, but uh, for example, this one here is actually number five. So this one is, this had the second largest amount of material removed. So this is actually one of the modified pistons. And I think this one here is number one. So this is completely unmodified. And then just side by side there, this is the difference in what's been removed. So. It's a very small bit, it's absolutely minuscule, but again, it had to be done. Uh, we, the last thing we wanted is uh, the piston slamming off the inside of the cylinder head. And just to compare, uh, these are two original pistons, so this is number one and number nine. Up against each other, it's perfectly smooth. There's nothing there at all. Uh, one thing is a little bit of an annoyance, I don't know if it happened here, I don't know if it happened in transit, um, or with the guys, but there is a little nick here. Uh, on number nine um, so just there beside the valve relief and I also noticed that uh, more annoyingly on number 11 I think it is yes it's number 11 here and you'd barely even see it but we have a little bit of a ding here and um, it's very very small 
but it does actually impinge on the side. If I actually hold it like this and knock it down the side of the skirt, you can see that it's ever so slightly proud and you can just slightly feel it. So I'm just going to have to take the edge off that. But otherwise, I've examined all 12, they're all absolutely perfect, aside from this little hiccup. But yeah, I'm delighted with the finish and I can finally get round to reinstalling these pistons. Three months later. Last night I assembled piston number one and I installed it in the block and it went nice and smoothly which means I still have to assemble and install all 11 of these pistons and I'm going to do it in pairs. So here I have piston number two and piston number three. I'm going to assemble these and then pop them into the block and the first step of that is to clean both of these pistons thoroughly. Uh, they were nice and clean but just to make sure there's no packing material or any other residue on the pistons before they get assembled and installed. So let's give them a bit of a clean. And that just goes to show they're far from clean. Before I can reinstall my wrist pin, I'm going to have to install my circlip and I'm going to install it on this side first as I want the pin, which is marked here, to go back in the way that it came. I don't think it particularly matters, but again, I want to keep everything just the way it was. So the technique that I have is I get the clip and I insert one end, one pointed end into the groove, like so. So it's essentially kind of a third of the way in there. And I kind of hold it in place, give it some downward pressure with my thumb so it doesn't fly out. Then get the screwdriver in behind the clip like so. And then just give it a downward bit of pressure like so. That is essentially in, but it just won't pop in. There we go. And that's it in. And the last thing that you want, you don't want your opening to sit over this large opening. So it's slightly off center there, which is absolutely fine. In the worst case, you can actually rotate it around, no problem. In terms of installing the pin, I just put a very small bit of oil on the outside of the pin and then line it up with the boss hole located on this side of the piston. Now what I do is I just make sure everything is aligned and straight on every axis, which it is there. That's also nice and straight. That's also straight. And then we can give it a light tap with the mallet just to get it started. Now we just check everything again, make sure it's lined up. Everything has stayed nice and straight. Let's put it upside down. And then same thing again. Now it's actually gone slightly out of straight there. But then you find that it lines up again nice and easily. Once our pin is protruding ever so slightly on the inside, we can grab our connecting rod. And I like to install a very small bit of lubricant on the inside of this bushing. And these are actually inserts. It doesn't look like it, but there's actually a small insert there. And we can install our connecting rod into position and continue hammering home. Make sure everything moves nice and smoothly. I'm going to remove my tape before it starts to cause me trouble. Make sure there's no residue left. Nearly there. 
there we go just as the tone changes we know we're seated right up against the clip and now we can install our second clip That one went in a whole lot easier. And that's the piston reassembled. And let's not forget the all important rings. We're going to start with the lower ring, which is the two piece ring. So, once again, we just need to separate it ever so slightly and drop it down over the top. Not that far. So, once it's in the bottom groove, we can just collapse it once more, make a note of where the join is. So I'm going to have it located right here, which means that the split in the ring needs to go directly 180 degrees opposite it, which is on the opposite side. You don't need the ring spreader for this one, it actually goes on pretty easily. And we just want to place it directly over the spring, like so. I'm just going to examine it all the way around, make sure it's fully seated, which it is. Then we move on to the middle ring, which is marked top. That's our middle ring installed. And then we have our top ring, which is the toughest spring. Make sure it's nice and clean. And that installs nicely. That's all three rings installed and I have my lower bearing lubricated as well, ready to roll. And here is the bearing cap, also ready to roll. So we've got red in the cap and blue in the actual connecting rod itself. So that is piston number two, ready to roll. I've wiped down my cylinder bores, I have some engine oil here, I'm just going to lubricate up the cylinder walls for the second time. So I'm going to do two and three together. I've got piston number two inside my ring compressor, all the rings are fully lubricated up as are the skirts and it's ready to be inserted. We're going to follow the direction of the arrow which is towards the front of the block. Make sure it's properly seated and then just tap the compressor down against the face of the block. And start tapping in place. And there we go, that's piston number two installed. We're going to gently tap it down until it meets the crank. Perfect. Now we can do piston number three. You know what, instead of doing piston number three, I'm going to install the cap on two, get the bolts in, and then I'm going to just rotate the crank, make sure everything's moving nice and smoothly, instead of doing multiple pistons at once, and then you encounter some kind of resistance, and you're not sure which one is causing the issue. So. Let's install this cap. I also have them lubricated on their sides. And I've got my brand new set of bolts here. Like I say, I can't quite remember. I think they're 180, 190 euro for a whole new set. Who remembers the torque sequence? So we have five newton meters. Then we have 20 newton meters. And then we have 70 degree angle. A 
of 70. Seventy. I have the crank lined up again to where I need it to be and this is piston number three. All looped up and ready to roll. Our arrow is pointing forwards. And of course we need to give it a quick spin. Lovely and smooth, I'm just doing that with the palm of my hand. And from the top side. Lovely. No problems there. Fantastic, so we now finally have all 12 pistons reinstalled in the block, Bring me back to where I was three or four months ago. Piston protrusion on three, four, five and six is now absolutely perfect. The measurements I gave to the guys in Micron were abided by perfectly and I now have perfect levels of protrusion. So let's take a zoom in uh, or a deep dive if you will on number five and number six and I will show you up close the now perfect levels of protrusion and if you recall Piston number five and piston number six had the most amount of material removed. Number six had 0.6 of a millimeter removed. So this just goes to show how much was removed and how perfect it now is as he throws a bit of fluff onto the deck. So again, I'm fully aware I should be using a dial bore gauge for this process, but this feeler gauge is more than adequate for demonstration purposes to show you how perfect it now is. So uh, this dial bore gauge, Sorry, this feeler gauge that I have, you should be able to see that. I have a 0.4 and a 0.43 stacked together, giving a total thickness of 0.83 of a millimeter. And sitting it at the wrist pin location, you will now see it is now perfect in terms of protrusion. If anything, the piston is probably sitting around 0.8 or so because there's a slight lip on the actual feeler itself. And again, at the other axis, perfect. And here as well. Perfect. And again, don't take my word for it. Let's rotate it upwards ever so slightly so I can't be accused of it not being a TDC. So it's now gonna start coming up. As you can see, it didn't move a tiny bit. It's just wanting to stay flat and now it's going down again. Let's do the same on number five, lifting all the way up. This had something like 0.45 removed if I recall. Again, we're lifting all the way to TDC. Still rising, still rising. That's still pretty flat. And I can't quite get in the wrist pin location. But again, you'll see that's perfectly flat. Again, the same 0.83. And I actually can't feel any difference between that at all. That's absolutely perfect. And here, there's a slight lip on the actual feeler gauge, which means this side of the piston is sitting ever so slightly down, which is perfectly normal. And again, the same on this axis. An ever so slight lip again on the feeler gauge, which means the piston is actually sitting slightly lower. So it's probably closer to 0.8, something like that. So again, I'm just gonna demonstrate putting the piston down again. So it should be rising, but it's not. That's it dropping straight away. So that was at TDC. So we have perfect protrusion. You know what, I was actually gonna keep going with this video. I was gonna get the head gaskets installed, put the front timing cover on, put the crank back on, determine TDC, get the heads installed, all torqued down, get the underside bolted on again, uh, and just have a kind of more complete video. But I actually want this video to be over. I don't wanna keep going with this video because I kinda of want it behind me. I haven't decided what I'm gonna do regards uh, the machine shop, to be honest with you. 
Uh, if I total all the parts, I mean, Jesus Christ, all the machining, uh, all the stretch bolts I had to buy again, all the sundry expenses, uh, I obviously didn't have to get them all steer coated, uh, but even accounting for getting four tops done, which would have had to be done. Uh, and then just applying an arbitrary amount, say 20 quid an hour to the amount of hours that I've spent. I must have spent 20 plus hours on this. I'd say close to 30 hours, I'd imagine. I'm probably in for one and a half grand in terms of fixing this mistake. Um, so it's just been an absolute nightmare. But I'm glad this video was over. But the good news is, in the background, I've actually been working on the car quite a lot because the engine block has been sitting here idle for, you know, the guts of three months. So the entire front end of the car is a shell right now. I've both the front wings removed, the front bumper, the front splitter, all that's been taken off. And like I mentioned, the entire engine bay is just completely empty, which that was incredibly daunting to start with, but just sitting down, neatly cataloging everything, taking your time, taking everything out in a specific order so we can go back in the same order. I actually quite enjoyed that process, the kind of nuts and bolts element of it, working out all the, I suppose all the brake lines and all the wiring of the doors, the entire doors have been taken apart, all the regulators, they're completely empty, there's empty shelves right now. And I'm just trying to work out what work to kind of farm out. So I'm thinking of sending off the doors, uh, uh, sunroof cover, uh, the bonnet, and a few other kind of metal pieces that have a lot of rust that I can basically just throw in the van and actually take them off uh, for kind of specialist rust repairs to actually repair them and the actual body itself is going to need quite a bit of attention as well. But I also have a video coming up in only about a week or so because it's actually about 90% done because I'll be documenting the rear subframe. I dropped that and that was some job taking that apart. Wait until you see the state of the rear sub, uh, subframe and all the related suspension components. It is crazy how much rust there is on that. So that was quite a fun process also. And quite satisfying just getting rusty bolts off and uh, as horrible that, as that may seem, I actually find it quite enjoyable. So work has been going on in the background. I haven't just been sitting here all depressed about this block and that video should be coming out uh, re regarding the rear subframe in about a week, maybe a week and a half. So please stay tuned. If you can, please share this video around because I'm 1500 euro in the hole. So uh, anything that you can do in terms of viewership and getting that number up would really help me out. So thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in the next video.